More than 30 million Americans have some kind of hearing loss. And with the crisis of coronavirus, everyone needed to have concise information and updates. Well, fortunately for Los Angeles, there's a wonderful team of ASL interpreters. And I'm delighted to have with us today Rick Pope, the coordinator for Los Angeles and the ASL team. So how does ASL work? How is the information getting across? Well, obviously it's a visual gestural language. So the best way that I can describe it, um, one of my mentors, uh, Betty Colonymous, actually had came up with what they call the Colonymous model. And essentially what that is, is you take the source language, what in this case English, mm -hmm. and you actually try to get a picture in your head first before you even raise your hands, because it's that picture that you're going to describe or paint with your hands essentially your hands, your face, uh, your body. Um, so that's how the actual process of interpretation works. In terms of the linguistic roots, it actually came from the French sign language. Uh, in the 1800s, a gentleman named Gallaudet uh, took a boat ride back over to the States with another gentleman named Leclerc, who taught Gallaudet the French sign language. Okay. Gallaudet uh, came to uh, U.S. shores and established the first school for the deaf in Connecticut, the American School for the Deaf. And eventually, uh, Gallaudet University, the only university specifically for deaf people located in Washington, D.C., was named for him. But that French sign language then combined with Native American Plains uh, Indian sign language formed the basis of American sign language. There was no, I mean, how do you express global pandemic. I mean, there were things that you had to create the language within the language in order to express the information. Well, one of the things that we're taught is to interpret for meaning. Okay. There is no necessarily a, a, a verbatim interpretation word for word. It's really more concept for concept. So a pandemic would be interpreted something like uh, a disease that has spread around the world. Okay. Uh, coronavirus, we didn't have a sign, uh, but the deaf community has always, the language has always adapted to the reality just like any other language and we came up, or the deaf community came up with coronavirus, which if you take a look at the molecular photographs that they have, that you have the nucleus of that virus and then those little spiked proteins uh, surrounding it. So you figure out what that picture looks like and what it's going to look like in context and it spread pretty quickly. So let's talk about your profession, your community and the impact it has. Um, having worked with uh, this entire realm for as long as you have, what do you know firsthand? How does this help people who have hearing loss and rely on this? What is the benefit to them and why is it so critical and why should we be sensitive to it? Uh, so social distancing is a, is, a, is a real issue in the deaf community, therefore that information by all means has got to get out to the deaf community that just following cultural norms could endanger you. What about masks? Is that going to impact people's ability to communicate? Because as you said, it's not just the hand gestures, it's facial gestures. You know, there's so much that goes into, which is why it's fascinating to watch an ASL interpreter because of the emotion and the, the, the humanity of what it is that they're doing. How are the masks going to impact? I would really like to emphasize what you just said, that it is a, the work of humanity mm -hmm. is really what it is. Uh, how the masks will impact, um, clearly with most of the language actually being on the face. Uh, there, it's almost like a text. You get a text and you're not quite sure what the intent is behind it. If somebody's being sarcastic, if they're angry, if they're uh, happy, sometimes you get that text. It doesn't, you're not sure what the context is. And I think that's going to happen a lot uh, with the masks. and people are going to need to understand that this is the field of human interaction. It is never wrapped up nice and pretty with a bow. And this is going to further complicate it. Uh, that people who have different communication styles and needs, different languages, and we're going to have to figure this one out. So in order to make things as accessible as possible and to serve humanity in the best way that we can, we need to have a comprehensive approach 
to how we provide that communication access, interpreting, captioning, how we uh, communicate electronically, say to people who are blind. Uh, that's the entire suite, and that's what I would say to emergency managers. To the public at large, uh, I would say absolutely pay attention to the things that you need, like batteries. Oh. Batteries for hearing aids. Right. Uh, batteries for wheelchairs. They're the most uh, desired um, uh, pieces of equipment that, that are asked for. So it, it really is all about building your toolkit, making sure you have the food and the water and the medications and the equipment and the durable medical equipment if you need it, your prescriptions, and build that out for the week or two weeks that emergency management is, is suggesting that you do that. You have to have your own kit, but you have to personalize it because what you will have in your kit won't be the same that I have in mine, won't be the same as you know Joe has in his or Jane has in hers. You began interpreting very young. How old were you? For every child who has a deaf parent, I think that might be a difficult question because it's really something of a way of life. Always was. Um, you know, this is before we had various laws in play. This is before we had telephone relay services. Um, this is before video relay. I can remember at one time uh, I had to interpret for my dad and the mechanic and I must have been seven, eight, and uh, it didn't go down very well because the mechanic heard this young boy's voice oh. saying something like, oh, it might be the carburetor. And the mechanic says, oh, for a kid, you seem to know a lot about cars. And like a dutiful interpreter and child, I interpreted that to my father, who immediately took offense that he was being called a child. Oh, no. So we got in the car, and he was steaming. Just, I told my dad, dad, and he wouldn't listen to me. Got down in the mechanic, and he's like, do I look like a child? <laughs> <laughs> that was probably one of the most uh, um, impactful. I was going to say, that's a memory uh, that won't leave you. It won't. And, no. it, and it shows you quite often why using kids as interpreters in emergency situations may not be the best. Oh, interesting point. I hadn't thought about that because frankly I was going to say there is also a trend now of teaching infants uh, sign in order to allow them to communicate before they have the verbal prowess. Yes, uh, I've done that with my own child and let me tell you it really cuts down on the temper tantrums. This is incredibly fascinating and as much as I know that this you said that it's it's kind of an awkward scenario or difficult or not the, the ideal that there's a focus here. The information that you're sharing is really inspiring, you know, making people want to be more interested. So I think all in all, as terrible as all this has been and as difficult as it been for you and your colleagues, this might have generated something very positive. I'm hoping so. Again, if you take a look at, at uh, across Google and the attention that's been paid to sign language interpreters across the country, uh, it has absolutely become a watershed moment for interpreting. It has shed the, the light on interpreting and the work that we do. Um, it has shed light on the fact that there are deaf people that use sign language in our communities, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we see them. Uh, there is still work to do in terms of getting the message across to communities that uh, perhaps are deaf but don't use American Sign Language. Um, there's work to do in terms of getting certified and deaf, deaf interpreters, people who are actually deaf themselves, in front of the camera to deliver that message as rapidly and concisely as possible. Uh, there's work to do in figuring all of this out in a socially distanced uh, environment and quite often uh, an environment that is thrown together at the last minute. So we, we've got work to do, but absolutely the light that's been shed on the profession uh, is unlike anything I've seen my entire life. With the cancellation of hundreds, if not thousands, of performances and the closure of so many venues across Los Angeles, 
That means there's lack of income for not just the artists, but the venues themselves. Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. My guest here has some good news. I'd love to welcome Joe Smoke, Grant's Administration Division Director of the Department of Cultural Affairs. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. All right, let's just sort of do the basic overview. Let's do it. If no one knows what the Department of Cultural Affairs is or what its role is, how would you describe it in your elevator speech? Uh, my elevator speech would be the arts, design, entertainment, and fashion industries together make up the cultural sector, the creative sector of Los Angeles. It's our number one economic engine. One out of every six people in Los Angeles is employed in this creative sector. And the Department of Cultural Affairs is a very small and mighty department of 100 people. And our role is to uh, focus on a spectrum of services, diverse, educational, free and low cost for the public. We're huge fans of the commercial arts and entertainment industries, but we don't deal with commercial art. We deal with the artists and the arts organizations that want to do a public service, free or low cost. And you actually are funded, I would imagine, through the generosity and the kindness of strangers, but there's also development fees, correct? That correct. Help? The Department of Cultural Affairs has two funding sources, one tax and one fee. So we receive about 1% of the tourist occupancy tax, which is the hotel bed tax. So when people come to Los Angeles and they stay in a hotel, a percentage of their uh, hotel bed tax fee comes to the Department of Cultural Affairs. And we're also funded by developer's fee. So when a developer builds a building in Los Angeles that is non-residential and is valued at a quarter of a million dollars or greater, there are fees attached to the permitting and planning of that building. And those fees also come to sponsor our department. I don't think there's a building that's ever been built in Los Angeles that's not that's commercial that's <laughs> that's under two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that's man. Now, obviously, when it's a normal operating day, you know the DCA funds and gives grants to a huge array of organizations. Does it not? C correct. We we deal in volume. It's a busy, active city. Um, I have a staff of two and a half really dedicated people, and we have about 350 vendors each year, producing about 1,200 free and low-cost events, arts activities, workshops, festivals. Together, that portfolio is about $4 million of our department's budget, and we manage to uh, serve 2.3 million people every year with those events. When the pandemic hit, the DCA immediately created this fund to help out. Sure, so let me tell you a little bit about the, the pivot. So we had a very interesting partnership with a business incubator called Community Partners, which is located at the California Endowment. We had a $200,000 contract with them. We were using it to seed street and sidewalk festivals, new events that had never taken place before. And uh, the program had three years of success. We sponsored 10 to 15 new street and sidewalk events every year. Immediately after the Safer at Home policy, we knew that that program wouldn't continue. And so we asked our community uh, collaborating agency if they would work with us to reimagine that program. So we created the Artist Emergency Relief Fund and we used that, that $200,000 and some other money that's been swept and donated into the fund and we've created a mini grant program. So thus far, we've spent $181,000. We've funded 471 artists with mini grants of $400. And these are monies that is a true relief program. We're, we're, we're giving them the money because they have spent time, bought materials, and lost a job due to the Safer at Home policy. We also rolled out in disciplines. So music, dance, and theater was first. That was uh, our decision because there's so many artists working in those fields. Uh, they could immediately tell us the date of where the event was gonna take place, in uh, the, play the site in Los Angeles. They could get a letter saying that the event had been canceled. We just needed those assurances. And as we've got done with round one, we've added film, media, literature, 
and educational teaching artists. Is there a personal element to these? We're hearing about people who are, need the money for food, they need the money for rent, they've put out a lot of money um, to rehearse a dance presentation that's not going to happen, or they're so bummed that they, had, they have a new book and they were about to do a reading at a bookstore and, and that reading's been canceled, so they've lost not only the visibility of that reading, but the potential sale of the book um, because they're not going to be promoting it. So we've heard a lot of personal stories and, and honestly, the thank you letters have been really amazing. Many of these artists have never written a grant proposal before. They've never filled out a form. They had no idea what to expect. Um, and so our strategy of doing these in rounds and batches and releasing different artistic disciplines has worked in our favor because we, we, don't, we have a wait list. Um, we don't have a list of rejected applicants. We're just moving forward and hopefully we're going to get to everybody. Our office is working on relief, then we're going to work on COVID response, and then we're going to work on COVID recovery. We expect to reimagine our work in those three ways. And so this is true relief. It's for lost time and lost wages. We have a new program for the theater district in NoHo. Um, the council member and his staff have asked us to post a grant to help the theaters reopen because we want those businesses in the recovery mode to be able to open safely and for the public to enjoy live theater again. The cultural ecology of Los Angeles runs from super large institutions like the LA Philharmonic and the LA County Museum of Art down to tiny, you know, one person entrepreneurs that work in the gig economy and work on a project by project basis. So we have to have our eye on all of those uh, uh, reactivations. Um, artists first because they they live with very few very little margin in the gig economy now we're moving to small and mid-sized organizations and eventually we'll actually help promote the large institutions reopening as well the immediacy of what of what you've been able to do is incredibly impressive because as you said this was a pivot this was a pivot that you had to get buy-in from not only the funders or those those that had actually created this you know, this pool of money to begin with. Yeah, we have an amazing collection of, of community partners. We have great thought leaders in the city council. Uh, we have an amazing executive director who is making the rounds and understanding what people want. And we know the community needs this support. And so we're trying to create fast, easy, and rewarding mechanisms to get them back to work. We've had such a great um, response not only from the artist community saying this is needed and so welcome, but Community Partners, which is our collaborating agency, put out a call um, to the community to donate. And we've received very small donations from people who wanted to take a tax write-off and wanted to donate uh, $400 and sponsor an artist. Uh, we just got word last week of a very prestigious family foundation called the Durfee Foundation in Santa Monica has written a, a wonderful um, support check to the Artist Emergency Relief Program. And so we're not saying when it's going to close because we, if we can raise money and continue to fund people, then we don't have to close a program. If people really want to apply for these grants, these uh, this relief fund on a very basic, it's just it's all online, it's all on the Department of Cultural Affairs website. It's very simple. You go to culturela.org, you'll see a little box that says grants and calls. Immediately you'll click through. You'll see a list of every program that's open. So if, if you're an artist and you've lost wages, um, you live in the city of Los Angeles and your canceled gig is in the city of Los Angeles, then you click on Artist Emergency Relief Fund and you fill out your one page form. It's super simple. You just drop in your data and then the staff will call you if they have any questions or there's something that uh, doesn't match. Well, that is really exciting, incredibly needed, mm -hmm. and I am, have no doubt that uh, you are going to have a file of unbelievably poignant thank yous. So I wish you all the best and, and thank you so much for supporting all the artists. My pleasure. Thank you so much. and 69 square miles. That's a lot of space, and that happens to be the dimensions of the city of Los Angeles. 
Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Vince Bertoni, the Director of Planning for the City of LA, joins me today. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. What's your elevator speech to explain to somebody <laughs> exactly what the role of the planning department well, is? Well, many people, many everyday Angelinos, don't understand that the city is actually very consciously shaped through rules. This is the 100th anniversary of our department, so it's been around for 100 years. What we really do is look very long term at the city overall in terms of how in different ways it should grow. And then we also work day to day. When individual development projects first come in, many of them have to go through our department just to make sure that those really kind of are in keeping with what the plans are, what the plans and the vision are. Okay, so within the full department, there are different focuses of attention. So what are some of the big right. ones? How we're kind of organized as a department is we have, um, some of us look at citywide policy. Um, we also do community planning, and that's where we take our citywide vision and, and really, really fine-tune it to the individual areas of the city. So the city, and how large it is, is divided into 35 community plans. And so those community plans are really where the pedal hits the metal in terms of how we, we can really shape our communities. And then we also have our development services, and that's when we're ensuring that the development really completes the vision mm -hmm. that we have both in our citywide um, planning as well as our community plans. Not all projects need to go through our department, but certain ones do if they may have um, particular impacts in an area. We're going through a very tumultuous time. Mayor Garcetti mentioned that the city planning department would streamline any kind right. of needs and permits that people might have right. at this particular time. I think one of the keys right now is COVID-19 is, is really forcing government to be way more nimble. We've done that by really moving more of our services online than we had in the past. And so it's really given us an opportunity to really operate differently. And we're also doing um, things that are tangible that you'll be seeing as, as you walk or drive down the street. The city and the mayor enacted the um, LA Alfresco um, program, which what that does, it makes it easier for restaurants because of the new rules, they have to create more physical separation within their restaurants which means a lot fewer customers um, can dine indoors. We've done a streamlined program where restaurants can actually dine outdoors in places that previously weren't allowed. So you can turn a parking lot, perhaps a sidewalk, and maybe part of a, a parking space that may be on the street into outdoor dining. And you've started to see some of this where you've seen some restaurants put in the green turf to, to make it feel like more of an outdoor garden space, which otherwise would be a parking lot. So are those gonna be temporary permits until we're past what is considered the crisis period or are these things yeah, gonna stick? The, the idea is to, to keep this through um, the COVID-19 crisis when they're not allowed to use all their dining space with the idea that they'll be going back to the, um, the in, in where their spaces are now. But it's also given us the ability to, we also need to be looking long-term beyond COVID-19 to do more streamlining efforts because it's not just about during COVID-19, it'll be about afterwards. So, that, so that, that we can really rethink some of our systems because we know that our, our economy is, is feeling a lot of pain right now. We wanna make sure that we can kind of keep the, the economy moving forward. But we have to do that in a way that understands the needs of our communities. Um, and so that's going to be some of the things as we look at COVID-19 that, that, that we're going to be doing. I mean, the impacts of COVID-19 have not been the same across. And, and if um, our communities, um, um, black, Blacks and Latinos are twice as likely to die of COVID-19 than whites are. And so those communities have felt particular pain. We need to really pay attention to that. And, and we're going through this kind of reflection period right now, I think, as a society. And when we talk about racial justice and, race, and, and equity, we need to look at it in everything we do. And that's gonna be a real, you know, that's gonna be a real re-engineering of the thought. So, so when I look at things such as restaurants and, and, and opportunities, whatever it is, that's part of the COVID-19 response, but we also have to think of other things that are impacting these communities too. One of the things we still really can't do um, as we slowly reopen of COVID-19 is to assemble in, in, in large places. And so much of what we do is community meetings. It may be small groups, it may be large groups, and that community interaction, I, I will tell you, that's one of the things I miss the most, having been a planner for 30 years. Good ideas come is, out of that. Absolutely, and having this this small interaction with folks um, is very meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, coming to them where, where they live and where they work and coming to their community and walking their streets, trying to, to understand their experience, just try to walk in their shoes for, for, for a few moments to help better plan those areas. 
that's something I really do miss. But I will tell you, the one thing that we've been able to do is to um, reach out to people in different ways. So we've been doing a lot of online meetings where we basically create like virtual meetings. And what that's allowed us to do is reach actually a lot more people than we have in the past because they wouldn't have the time to take off work, um, take out of their busy lives, um, to drive to City Hall, to drive to a city office somewhere in LA. They can participate in what happens in their government. And, and that aspect, I really wanna keep going because I think it's, it's when I talk about equity um, in what we need to do, especially as we're, we're, we're being very, I think, self-reflective um, right now. We need to be able to figure that out. That we look through the lens of equity is how do we keep this, these kind of web type of, of um, engagements moving forward. Some of the things that you also consider beyond just the economic value of right. something or whether it fits into a zone. I mean, there's a lot of other nuanced decisions right. that go into the permitting process too. We're looking at people's personal safety and and, um, and that's a, uh, an important aspect of what we do. Air, mobility, transportation. Absolutely. Well, you know, health. Um, I mean, the, the, the air people breathe and how we plan communities. We are actually fundamentally rewriting our zoning ordinance oh. so for the first time since 1946. So if you can, the last time our, our, our zoning ordinance was, was, was written from the ground up was just right after World War II. If you think about 1946, the idea was that everyone to have a car and we we're just about to start, you know, the expansion of our freeway system. Now, we're not, we're not looking at the car for all the answers for how we get around the city. We're looking at public transit. We're investing a lot in subways and rail and buses. We're investing in bicycle lanes and we're actually thinking about, you know, walking in LA. All those things come together in terms of how this city is actually operating now and how we're doing it in the future. So we're gonna really fundamentally rethink it so that it really reflects how we're, we're really moving around today. And it also needs to really reflect some of those issues of equity that I mentioned earlier, that we are really treating our, all of our communities equitably. Um, and so that's something that we wanna make sure that we include. We've created great disparities through planning um, all over the country, including Los Angeles over the last you know, 100 years and more. I mean, the examples of if you look at Boyle Heights, which was, uh, you know, was and still is a thriving Latino community, and we cut it up with four or five freeways, and that created a lot of health impacts from all the, the exhaust from the freeways. You look at South Los Angeles, um, really a thriving um, black community, and how we put industrial right next to homes, next to churches, and things like that. And before, and that really created some, some health impacts. There's so many things that have created health disparities um, in, and, it's, and a lot of things create health disparities, but what we do in planning, it contributes to that. I should say we, we um, if you live um, in Watts, your average lifespan, and I'll make sure I have this number correct, is roughly 13 years less than if you live in Brentwood or Palisades. Um, and that's a huge health disparity. Um, that 13 years is the same difference between um, the countries that have the best health care systems in the world and those that have the worst. We have it here in our own city, and it happened for a lot of reasons, but a lot of it is how we planned our city. Laws that were created throughout this country, zoning is some of them, over time um, created great inequities. When we look at this and we think about our zoning, we, we really need to look back to see how those practices and there may be just so many of them numerously that, that just grew exponentially over time, how that's really impacted these communities and see how we, we can change that in the future and really uplift these communities. And we really need to be uplifting lots of, lots of voices right now. And, and um, it's gonna be a challenge, it's gonna be a big challenge. And, I, and what's gonna take it is gonna take, it's gonna need all of us inside of ourselves to really be up for that challenge. Okay, so what's the website so that people can get in touch? It's www.planningforla.org, and uh, so that's planning the number for la.org. Okay, well, here's hoping you get lots of voices in your head to help you plan for the future. Okay. All right, it was great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks so much.